Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Elisa Klein and I'm the director here at Neary Preston Training Center. And I wanna welcome you to today's webinar, Prevention for Professionals, Identifying and Responding to the Risk and Protective Factors for Youth Perpetration of Sexual Abuse with David Prescott, LICSW, and Becky Palmer, MS. This is the second of a kind of mini series within our uh, webinar series. It's primarily designed as a piece of our <clears throat> Prevention for Professionals project, which is also known as P4P, um, a project that we've been working on here at Neary Preston Training Center over the last year um, with a very generous grant from uh, Vision of Hope which is a grant program that's run by the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. Prevention for Professionals, for those of you who don't know, is a companion project to our parent-to-parent -parent project, which is known as P2P, um, a project that we created two years ago. Both projects are designed as primary prevention projects um, P2P was designed for parents of kids who may be at risk to develop sexual behavior problems to give them the tools that they need to address uh, those problems so that their child doesn't act out in sexually abusive ways. The Prevention for Professionals project is designed for the other adults in kids' lives, um, specifically teachers, school counselors, school staff, coaches, uh, pediatric professionals, and the idea is to <clears throat> provide them with the tools to identify and mitigate risk for the development of sexual behavior problems in the children with whom they work on a daily basis. And for both of these projects, we also developed uh, tools that guide adults if a child does in fact develop sexual behavior problems and acts out abusively so that they know how to respond, how to interact with the child, um, for the professionals, how to interact with the child's family, and to find the resources that they may need to mitigate that risk in the future and to get assistance. Um, you can see all of the materials that we've created and curated for P2P and P4P on the Neary Press and Training Center website. So please visit those web pages. Um, many of you know, I'm going to get to the sad part here, many of you know that uh, very sadly this is Neary Press and Training Center's last webinar ever. Uh, two weeks ago we made a broad public announcement that in late September, after 18 years of operation, Neary Press and Training Center will be closing. Um, as we wrote in our letter to the public, there are numerous reasons for this very difficult decision for us. Uh, Neary Preston Training Center was the passion project of its founder, the late Steve Bengis, who many of you knew. Um, and as a nonprofit micro publishing house, and then later um, with the training component, as well, Neary Preston Training Center has always struggled financially but with really significant changes over the past several years in both the publishing industry and in our field of sex offender treatment and management and uh, working with youth with sexual behavior problems, it really has become impossible for us to continue. So it's with very heavy hearts that we had to make the decision to close down. And uh, I'll just take this opportunity to say that we thank all of you from the bottom of our very heavy but also very full hearts for your years of interest in what we do, your participation in our trainings and webinars, and for your patronage and purchase of our books. Um, so to transition back to this wonderful webinar that we have at hand, we're curious to know how many of you in the audience today have participated before in a Neary Press webinar. There is a poll on the screen. Click yes or no to let us know. All right, so it's looking like a full three quarters of you have been on webinars with Neary Press and Training Center before. Welcome back and we have 
26% that are new to uh, Neary Press webinars. So that's really exciting. And um, I hope that you came because this information from our uh, P4P project is of interest to you. We have another poll today because this webinar is a bit different than our usual web our usual webinars. Um, we're curious to know more about you as an audience. So we have another poll today. Let us know um, what you do professionally. Okay. So this is interesting. We have almost a third that are medical providers, 66% um, social workers. We don't have any teachers, unfortunately, online. 5% uh, are after school or community educators. And we don't have any pediatricians online, but um, we have some very interesting folks here, I can see. All right, um, as we do in all workshops and webinars, we uh, need to share with you the learning objectives of this webinar. Participants will be able to identify risk factors for sexual abuse by adolescents, identify protective factors that mitigate risk, identify warning signs for preventing sexual abuse, recognize the importance of nurturing protective factors, identify how protective factors can support youth in various domains of their lives, and lastly, understand the levels of prevention. And here are our amazing speakers. We have David Prescott with us all the way from Latvia today. Uh, it's 10 o'clock at night there, so bear with him. Uh, he is a past president of ATSA. He has been a contributor to the NERI newsletter for 11 years. We have loved our partnership with him. He has published 20 books, book projects in the area of assessment and treatment, particularly in the areas of abuse and trauma. Becky Palmer is a past board member of ATSA, chair of the ethics committee and secretary for the board of directors. She has published articles and book chapters. She has taught and lectured at several institutions in Chicago where she lives and works on abusive family systems, psychotherapy and psychotherapy of sex offenders. She completed postgraduate studies at the Institute for Juvenile Research in Marriage and Family Therapy. She provides training and consultation to other professionals. Welcome, Becky. Welcome, David. I think we're launching with David uh, to begin, and it's wonderful to have you here, and thank you to everyone who's participating. I'm handing it over now to David Prescott. going to show my screen. Okay, so now I'm unmuted. Hey, welcome back, folks. 74%. I didn't expect there to be so many uh, old friends uh, amongst, uh, amongst the audience, and uh, greetings to our new friends as well. So here's what I'm going to do, assuming you can see me. Um, I'm going to now make my slides nice and big, and I'm sure that Jonathan will uh, say something if there's uh, any issues. So right, well, away we go then. Um, yes, identifying and responding to risk and protective factors. Um, as Elisa was getting us started, I kept thinking to myself, risk factor is such a funny word. Um, in the circles in which I travel, it's a, it's a phrase that we know pretty well. Um, and on the other hand, it can be kind of hard to understand what exactly is a risk factor. Um, I did have the experience of going to see my doctor and he said, well, Mr. Prescott, your risk factors are that you're over 50 and you're a male. And I thought to myself, that's discrimination in its finest form, if, uh, if those are my risk factors. Uh, for our purposes, I tend to think of risk factors as being a kind of um, um, underlying vulnerability to a, uh, uh, to a certain condition. So 
let me get my slides to work. Very good. And uh, this is how you can contact me. I do have a website, but uh, and I but I tend to get emails at vtprescott at earthlink.net. Feel free to contact me. It might take me a few days to respond, but I do uh, get emails and I do read them and I do my very best uh, to respond as, uh, as quickly as I can. So I'm from the Northeast of the US, as Elisa noted, I'm currently in Riga, Latvia, um, on my way home to, uh, uh, to the Northeast tomorrow. So very briefly, just some very, very short background comments, some discussion of risk factors, some tips and considerations, and then sort of the ultimate goal of, uh, of what this is all about. If there's anything I've learned from doing this work for, it's actually 35 years now, it's that everything we assumed would be important in understanding um, young people uh, at risk to sexually abuse or uh, young people who have sexually abused, it's that everything we thought we knew was wrong. So. Okay, so just a little bit of background and some developmental aspects. The first place I want to go is not just with the risk factors necessarily, but how we understand these risk factors. And so I put up this, these, uh, these pictures here and uh, borrow a phrase called the flashbulb memory. And this, I think, is sometimes the enemy of understanding how risk operates in the kinds of kids that we uh, run into in schools or in the community um, or within our practices or what have you. And this has to do, the flashbulb memory is basically that moment when you realize that um, sexual abuse is harmful and you get an image of what sexual abuse is and what people who uh, perpetrate sexual abuse must look like. Or it could be you get an image of a kid who has done something um, that is objectionable in school and you get this kind of image that stays with you. It's, hot, it's a hot image at first and then it seems to crystallize in our brain. And one of the, one of the most puzzling aspects of doing this work for me is that the very things that make us most upset by sexual abuse um, are very often not necessarily the things that place people at risk for abusing in the first place. Bear with me, you'll, you'll see what I mean. But the images and the ideas that we get around sexual abuse are very often not the same thing as what professionals should be looking out for. It gets complicated, folks, so, uh, so bear with me. So remember, ultimately, all of this should be about safety first, but that itself can be a little bit complicated. We never obviously want to do harm to any kids, and we don't want to facilitate kids doing harm to themselves or each other either. However, as we think about risk and how we can have difficult conversations with kids that we think might be at risk, or with groups of kids in order to get involved in what we know as primary um, uh, prevention of sexual abuse, we have to remember to do no more harm. And sometimes we can actually cause harm in the name of doing good if we're not careful. So for example, um, believing that all people who have been abused are by definition scarred for life can itself be a form of of harm. I realize this might sound controversial and it takes a while to, to set in, but we have to be careful with our language because as it turns out, many kids who are abused are, although they go th they certainly go through some degree of harm, also are remarkably resilient um, young people who are able to go along in their lives and recover or integrate the aspects of trauma, et cetera. One could uh, write an entire book about this, and I believe some people have. So I'm gonna just leave it there, but always remembering that when we have conversations with kids, we want to make sure that we're doing no harm and doing no further harm as we go forward. So I'll just start here, a, um, a really classic article by uh, Elizabeth Letourneau and Mike Miner, both of whom went on to become ATSA president, uh, the, the presidents of the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. And a big article that they wrote, 2005, pointed out three basic realities that we should all keep in mind. And that is when we start to have concerns about kids, 
that they may be at risk to abuse or that they may um, actually have abused and we're not entirely sure, these are opportunities to intervene. And that this is sort of the bright side of the, uh, the picture that when we develop concerns about kids, we've got opportunities to get in there and do something about it. We've also found that kids who do sexually abuse actually have more in common with other kids who get in trouble with the law than they do with adult sex offenders, um, adults who've sexually abused. And this is where the flashbulb memory comes in, that we need to remember that these are different kids. They're not fully grown. They're not fully developed. They're much more dependent on their environment. And so we can't re rely on our images of what adults who abuse um, look like as we try to um, imagine um, how to how to have a conversation with a kid. And finally, the reoffense rates of kids once they do abuse are actually very different from adults. Uh, we used to think that this was a lifelong uh, concern. Now we find that the um, research is showing us that where abuse does occur, if it does occur, when in the unlikely event that it occurs again, after somebody's been caught, that in fact it happens fairly quickly, most typically while they're still in adolescence. So implications of all of this are warning signs that I'm gonna talk about can be an invitation to dialogue and intervention. And that, and most interesting and one of the most important points that I'll raise is that the same behaviors that signal general behavior problems can oftentimes also signal risk to engage in problematic sexual behavior. What this means is we always want to raise all of our kids in such a way that they can someday raise kids of their own, that just because it seems as though the kid is engaged in this behavior doesn't mean that he's not also at risk to develop some other kind of problem behavior. I'm not saying that they're all at risk to do everything. Rather, I'm saying that sometimes the same things can signal our, uh, can can be cause for our concern in a number of directions. This is why I always say, let's take a holistic view of all of our kids and try to move them into adulthood, um, preventing all kinds of behavioral issues that they might have. At the same time, we need to remember that young people can and very often do change in a very short period of time. It's, uh, it's actually 35 years of practice later, remarkable to me how this happens. So important to consider is this study here. Again, this is after kids have abused, but this fellow here, Michael uh, Caldwell, examined studies that have taken place since the year 2000 and found that once kids have come to the attention of people like you or various authorities, that they only very rarely actually go on to do it again. Their risk for other kinds of problematic behaviors is actually significantly higher. So again, I think if we view these as um, humans in the making and not people who are destined to a lifetime of destruction and havoc, we'll probably be doing better. One thing that I do am very aware of though is that this study did not take into account studies of severely mentally ill um, uh, young children uh, and adolescents. Um, so as, uh, as a result, there are a lot of kids that didn't make it into the studies. When I asked the author about this, he said, there just haven't been that many studies, but he wanted to do a, um, um, excuse me, there haven't been that many studies of severely mentally ill kids, but that he wanted to do an overarching uh, analysis of the scope of the problem. He found what we found elsewhere. The good news is assaults among young people have fallen to their lowest rate in 15 years. This is a headline from just last year. Every jurisdiction hopes that it's something that they're doing that's special, but this has been a planetary phenomenon. So the good news is the world is heading in a good direction. Um, the headlines might be depressing. Um, violence among, in certain areas might be of very great concern, but in terms of our children, um, the, uh, the news has actually been pretty good. So let's remember the context here that all youth are dependent on adults to take good care of them, that their experiences with adults can increase risk as well as decrease it. This means that any problem that adults can make better, we can also make worse. So where all of this is going to is the 
um, uh, wonderful and beautiful human conversation that we are all capable of uh, having with, with young people as soon as we start to see indicators of risk. Um, all youth are easily influenced by their peers and that we as adults have an obligation, an ethical obligation to shape the peer culture of uh, our schools and programs to the greatest extent that we can. And ultimately, all of these risk factors can ebb and flow according to various situations that our kids find themselves in. As a person who does risk assessments of people known to have abused, I always find with kids that I have to say, his risk is going to be dependent on the context and situations in which he finds himself. So basically there's been three subtypes that have been found in research. The first is when children engage in some kind of problematic sexual behavior and simply stop doing it after adults intervene. And then there, there are those that begin in adolescence and they too are most likely to uh, desist or to stop engaging in these behaviors by the time they reach adulthood. And then there's a small minority that we need to worry about, which is people who start very early and don't stop no matter um, what kinds of sanctions or responses adults seem to have. So um, uh, for example, I recently interviewed an eight-year-old who I might talk about a little bit later, who started at the age of eight and he continued and he didn't stop once people um, told him that he needed to stop, but he did stop once he went through an assessment and started participating in some kind of treatment. In this case, when a kid is eight years old, I really think the best kind of thing that can happen when these warning signs start coming up is to get the uh, family involved. In fact, it might be even more important to treat the family than the, uh, the kid themselves. So this fellow came along a long time ago and said the best predictors of when kids are about to embark on a career of juvenile delinquency, he said is, have they done various kinds of bad behaviors before and continued to do it? Are they at the ages of six to 11 um, getting involved in substance abuse, which tells me that there must be some severe trauma in the mix as well. Um, he also pointed out that young boys are more likely to get into trouble than young girls. Uh, and also that low socioeconomic status can be a, uh, a factor in all of this. Now keep in mind, this is risk factors for getting started between the ages of six and 11, not the same risk factors as continuing. Now check this out, this, this is really interesting. Things like low socioeconomic status, oh my gosh, it sounds, um, it sounds a sort of suspect. Um, oh, and of course also having an antisocial parent uh, doesn't help. Please notice that these factors are entirely different from the same authors coming along and noticing what is a predictor for adolescence. By the time kids become uh, early adolescents, it's actually much more likely that it will have something to do with their ties to the community and to their friends rather than um, their uh, antisocial parents. Now, this is the language of the researchers. I don't particularly care for the phrase antisocial for a number of reasons, but this is what the research showed with children. By the time that kids become adolescents, some of the things that turn out to be the most important factors for either the onset of problem sexual behavior or the persistence of sexual behavior is actually as simple as self-regulation skills impulsivity, um, coping style, things like this, um, attitudes and beliefs that seem to indicate a willingness to engage in uh, really problematic behavior, and inter, uh, interpersonal capabilities. If I could do anything with our kids, it would be to work towards getting them to feel competent in a wide range of relationships and to be able to res, uh, relate to others empathically. The reason I'm saying that this is so important is that in the past, we assumed that the risk factors for problem sexual behavior would have something to do with sexuality themselves. And that turns out not to be the case. 
um, much more often it's the kinds of things that you see here. Yes, a background of trauma is extremely important, but it's not as simple as he was sexually abused, therefore he's going to become sexually abusive. Rather, it's kids who experience adversity and tra traumatic experiences, including emotional abuse and neglect within their family or within their social influences, as you see here. These are the things that turn out to be um, much more important than, for example, abuse-related sexual interests. So where we get our flashbulb memories, uh, flashbulb, me flashbulb memories sometimes, is thinking that um, if um, this uh, young person has uh, engaged in a problematic sexual behavior somewhere, like in a classroom, um, that he's at risk to escalate in that particular behavior, it's actually just as likely to emerge from some of these other kinds of factors. So then what I want to ask, thinking about that constellation of factors is, is this factor present at home, at school, in the community, or with this person's friends? So for example, the eight-year-old that I assessed the other day, very interesting um, because in his case, what the school was seeing was not happening at home or in the community. And the kinds of low-level sexual behaviors, things like um, making a snowman with genitals, um, you know, in the wintertime, these kinds of things, or grabbing at teachers, that were annoying, the school was really concerned about them. He wasn't engaging in these behaviors at home. And the long story short is we came to realize that in fact, um, the school was such, um, uh, was, uh, such a challenging environment to him that he didn't have the, the faculties, the, uh, if you'll excuse that pun, let me try that one again. He didn't have the, um, the uh, internal resources to be able to manage the cognitive demands of a school day. So what they did is they got him a kind of guide to help him stay in a mainstream classroom, but people that could check in with him throughout the day, and they worked to keep the tasks relatively easy and that was enough to get him to slow down um, a lot of his behavior. So if it's not happening, let me go back. If it's not happening in all domains, I tend to be a little bit less concerned. So this is where we can begin to, to intervene. Some of the warning signs that I look for, are things like sexual verbalizations, despite redirection, any kinds of changes in relationships, including increased social isolation, um, any kind of emotional breakdown or collapse could signal some oncoming problems. Problems coping with stress, um, as I just said, cognitive overburdening um, in school or at home. Um, aggression against property and interestingly medication refusal, which sometimes can signal an ongoing um, attitude of um, entitlement to do as one pleases, um, as well as other kinds of pervasive attitudes um, of entitlement. So I'm gonna keep this part short. Um, ultimately, impulsivity and persistent rule breaking can be up to three times more important than other factors in one study. So many of us look at the sexual aspects, but we forget that good old fashioned impulsivity can be a real warning sign. We need to remember that sexual interests actually change dramatically across adolescence. So even if they do something objectionable, um, on one or two occasions doesn't mean that this is who they are as a sexual being. Things like orientation may start early, but other forms of sexual interest, not so much. And that's something that has been difficult for us to learn across the past few decades. So moving forward, unfortunately, sexuality is just a part of every kid's life. Um, so my advice, just stay as relaxed as you possibly can. Ask questions, but don't necessarily tell or give a lot of unwanted advice. Maintain a stance of curiosity. Ask them what's happening with them and certainly not what's wrong with them. Always emphasize that your number one job is to keep people safe. And as I say, when in doubt, chunk it out. Discuss behaviors and not the big picture. Express empathic concern. Ultimately, what we know about all people who come into contact with the law or display various kinds of problematic behaviors is that the safest people in our communities are stable, occupied with a job or at school, 
have supportive people to whom they're accountable, have plans for the future, and therefore everything to lose by doing it again. That's why I use the acronym SOAP. Stable, occupied, accountable, and having a plan. Usually our best interventions will have a cognitive behavioral foundation and will be trauma-informed with a twin focus of not just managing risks, but building a plan for a better life. So what I just wanna say is it's down to you to join up with your kids to have these conversations. I want us all to be as empathic as we can be. Empathy starts here, just looking in the mirror and studying oneself, and then hopefully, us, our ability to be able to join up with people and share a laugh or to share each other's heartaches. And then ultimately for all of us, hopefully to be able to join up with one another. That's the ultimate goal for all of us. The reason I emphasize all of these points so much is I really believe that we can truly leave no one, I, I believe we can leave no one behind. And uh, so that's what I have to say for right now. I'm going to turn it over to Becky. And um, I think I got this all done within our time frames, Becky. At least I hope so. So over to you. Hi, I'm Becky Palmer. I'm glad to be with you today. And um, I want to talk to you about protective factors. One of the assumptions that I have always worked under my entire 35 years of working with kids and families is that when a child is not doing well, I want to know why. And we have spent a lot of time over the years and decades of looking at what's wrong with the child or what's, what's impacting the child. And I'm going to talk about protective factors today because their way of mitigating risk. Um, and they mitigate risk and they help to promote development. You know, protective factors, what is that? As David said, risk sounded odd to him and, and certainly it does to the rest of us. But then I think, well, what's a protective factor? Well, for a lot of us, protective factors, really, if you think about it in terms of resiliency, Becky, um, yes. I, I think people aren't able to see your slides right now. If you just want to pull those up. Where are they? Oh, oh I see. Becky, you should be able to pull them up on your screen the way that you just pull them up, and then we will share your screen. Okay. Hang on one second, then. While you're doing... Oh, there you go. Okay. I was going to ask... I'm, David I'm so sorry. I, apo I apologize, everyone. Um, so here's my contact but information. Can you, can you put it into presentation mode? Oh, yes, I can. Hang on. There you go. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Um, Here's how you can contact me if you have any questions afterwards, uh, and I apologize for that mix up. They've tried to train me on this and I apparently still haven't learned. Um, so what's a protective factor? You know, a lot of different uh, disciplines identify protective factors in different ways, but the, the part that's really interesting is that they often have similar themes throughout. So like in child welfare, a protective factor is it's they look at family strengths. They look at uh, how to enhance child development, how to reduce child abuse and neglect. So in trauma survivors, how they look at it, they look at it in do the domains, like the individual domain, the relational community, family, society. And they're still looking at supportive families, nurturing parenting skills. And so there, across the board, there are some common themes. So protective factors help to mitigate risk. 
question is, are there mirror images? A lot of people think that if there's a risk, then there has to be a protective factor. Um, and that's not necessarily true. Sometimes there is, like for example, uh, you can have a risk factor of sexual preoccupation. A protective factor would be a moderate intensity and preference for normal sexual relationships. Another one would be a risk would be a resistance to rules and supervision. The protective factor would be acceptance of rules and supervision. So sometimes you can have them as mirror images and oftentimes they're not. There often are what we call promotive factors. And those are factors that have no corresponding risk. Like let's just say someone might have a very religious background and beliefs and that might be a factor that helps to intervene and mitigate the risk or having good sexual education and knowledge uh, for the youth. So why do we think about protective factors? Well, protective factors provide predictive validity in future research. Um, it helps to diminish labeling. You know, I'm, I'm really against calling someone a juvenile sex offender. Um, and giving them that label because that doesn't say all that the child is. It's just like calling someone your uh, your fat, and that's all that person is. It's we have to look at the youth as a whole, and so I think looking at the protective factors tells us that there's something there that helps to mitigate their risk. It also gives us a clear picture of the youth, and it helps to identify the areas of strength and hope. You know, when I go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, you really could use lose a few pounds. I'd, I'd like the doctor to not say that to me in a critical way, but to say that in a hopeful way. Say, you know, there's a number of diets at work and here's what seems to be helpful. That, that helps to promote the protective factors. So the question is, is it easy to identify the protective factors? Yeah, we can, however, the issue is, is that there's, there's a paucity of research uh, that helps to identify those factors. And there really isn't a, a valid assessment tool at this point that uh, can tell us what pro, uh, protective factors are. So we ha I'm taking a look at some of the literature and the research about sexual violence protective factors, which seem to go across uh, all areas. I would strongly encourage you to take a look at this uh, sexual violence or risk and protective factors. This uh, systematic review done by Aaron Casey and Tatiana Masters is phenomenal. It's thorough. It's a great uh, lit review and it will give you a, a lot of resources uh, for future work. One of the things that I found really really important was in, and this is from uh, Casey and Masters, was that they identified protective factors, empathy, and you can see the aggression types, bullying, youth violence, dating violence, adult interpersonal violence and suicide, and then they give you the references. But, you know, it's been argued, discussed, talked about, thrown back and forth, the whole concept of empathy, that, you know, we need to teach empathy uh, to, as a protective factor, as a way to get someone to not uh, sexually reoffend. But as you can see, uh, the review of the literature here found that empathy was only really a protective factor for those in bullying and dating violence. Uh, social support and connectedness across the board and school connectedness. And I think one of the things that I want to say as a family therapist and as a therapist is what I think kids are really missing here is the relationship aspect uh, and connectedness uh, individually with peers, um, in their within their families, and, it and within their communities. In fact, uh, last night, uh, a youth that I was working with has decided she needs to get unplugged from her iPhone. She watches media, sends pictures, listens to music. She's, her world is on that phone. And so she began working on a plan last night on how she was going to become unplugged. And 
it, it's interesting how insightful she becomes once she spends time off of uh, her device. All right. So what are some protective factors? So I try to pull together uh, from the different uh, domains what some people have identified as protective factors. And here are pictures of two colleagues and fr friends, a dear friend, Janice Bremer at the top and Jane Gilgan at the bottom. And they did some very early work, I wanna say back in the 90s, early 2000s, about what protective factors were for youth that we worked with. The first one they came up with was supportive families. And I think if you've worked with families and you found that families aren't supportive, it's really challenging for the youth to feel hopeful and to feel like they uh, can change. Education was important for the youth to be involved in their schools and their education process. Stability in one's daily life. We certainly know the challenges of youth when they come from chaotic homes. Adequate knowledge about human sexuality. You know, kids have questions. Kids are curious. They are faced in every avenue of their life with sexuality, not to mention everything that feels undefined that's happening to their bodies and the feelings that they're experiencing. And so it really is incumbent upon us as the adults and important people in their lives to make sure that they have adequate knowledge about human sexuality. Having a confidant. One of the things I've recognized in raising two boys and also working with hundreds of kids over the years is that kids want someone other than a parent as a confidant, a teacher, a therapist, a, a clergy person that they can talk to and not feel judged. Their ability to regulate their emotions and learning how to do that. You know, some of that happens after the brain fully develops. It was like when my, when my boys both turned 21, it's like they magically became somebody different because their brain had developed. But until then, it really is on us, again, as adults in our schools and our churches, um, within the work that we do as therapists, is to help them learn how to regulate their emotions. Finding opportunities to explore one's interests. And I know that in lower socioeconomic communities, that's even more challenging for youth to have the opportunity to find out what they're interested in, uh, sports, uh, arts, dance, music, art. Um, we really have to find ways to help grow that. And I think that's why it's so important that we have expressive arts for, for youth. And last but not least is hope. You know, as a therapist working with uh, a lot of families over the years who have felt hopeless, it has been my job uh, to bring them hope and to point out the things that are working in their lives and the things that are their strengths and are their resiliencies. And like David talked about in terms of risk, plans for the future seem to be what's really important in terms of protective factors. Again, you know, youth who live in poor communities have a harder time thinking about what the future is. It's, I mean, they get messages all the time about their value and their worth. And so teaching and helping kids learn to plan for the future becomes a good protective factor. And you know, one of the things I really want to encourage you, I know Elisa mentioned this at the beginning, but I want to encourage you to go to the Neary Press uh, website. There are some really great resources, both in terms of books, articles that you can uh, have access to, but also there's a couple of videos there. And this one uh, video is by Tom Schiff, and he talks real specifically about ways to support boys to be healthier men. And I think that as a society, we've, we've done a disservice to the boys uh, that we are growing up and that boys need to learn how to be okay and ask for help, that it's not just on them to figure it out. Um, also, helping them have a wider range of emotions. Uh, for example, like vulnerability, emotionality, nurturance. Um, I know that most of the boys that I've worked with there are about two emotions that they feel like it's okay to express, one being anger, the other one is they could be okay or happy. 
as they might call it. And that's, that's pretty limited compared to the girls that I've worked with who have a much wider range of emotions and can express that. And also, the thing that Tom talks about is bystander intervention. And is that, that really is teaching our boys how to call out other boys when they engage in behaviors that are disrespectful or aggressive. And I put this up because I just think it's really important. It seems like when boys become about nine or 10, they feel like they can't cry and that they, they just kind of suck it up and they take it in and they're, they're not allowed to be tearful. And I thought that this uh, really helped to express our need as adults to encourage boys to, to express their, their feelings and to not feel ashamed about how they are feeling and the expression of those. So why prevention? Well, prevention refers to the efforts to help stop perpetration of unhealthy and dangerous uh, sexual behaviors. So when we know what the risk factors are, then we can build and grow interventions and programs to help prevent those risk factors from having uh, so much power in a youth's life. Um, you know, prevention programs all have the same goal. And, and many years ago, I was working with a, a federal probation officer and, and we did several presentations together. We wrote a book chapter together about why it was important for probation and therapists to work together. And the common goal that we had and how we were going to get there might be different, but the common goal is no more victims. And that's the importance of prevention. You know, we're not a prevention oriented society in the least. Um, we are more of a society of, okay, if something happens, then, then we'll deal with it. So th th the issue is, is what, what's primary prevention? And that's programs that are developed to help prevent sexual abuse from happening in the first place. Secondary prevention is jobs like us as therapists who uh, provide counseling and help people after there has been sexual abuse. And then there's tertiary um, prevention, and that's long-term response. Um, and some of that can come through uh, policies at, in your organization and practices, funding, research, advocacy. Um, and that is one of the ways that prevention can work. And I think we, ha we, being all of us, have to work toward lifting up this concept that prevention is making sure it doesn't happen in the first place. So I'm going to be showing a, a really brief video. Um, and these are, this is a phenomenal video and I'm gonna tell you why, because these boys discovered a risk factor. Now this wasn't sexual abuse, but they discovered a risk factor and they, and they marshaled their protective factors and came together and uh, helped this kid out. Uh, so, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you now so you can show that video for us. Hi everybody, this is Elisa here. Um, I think because we seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulty with the video that we will move on to our question and answer uh, time. So David, if you wanna pull your camera back up, I'll pose, a, pose a, some of the questions that are coming in. 
We also don't have very much time left. Um, we only have about nine minutes left, so we'll do about five minutes of questions and answers. Um, so Becky and David, if you can keep your answers brief, that would be great. Uh, we got a question uh, specifically for you, David. Um, have you seen any connection between problematic sexual behaviors and animal abuse? David, we can't hear you. I think Jonathan, can you turn David's uh, microphone on? It's because of the video. There we are. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Oh boy, I can see you, but I can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I can't shout at you. So um, it's a great question. Off the top of my head, I have not. Um, I'm of the generation that heard that there was a connection between animal abuse and um, uh, and your uh, bedwetting and uh, and problem sexual behavior, uh, but I've never been able to actually find any research um, to, uh, to support that. Just the same, I would say that if I knew a kid was abusing animals, um, I would be having a conversation about developing respect for all um, living, uh, breathing beings. And uh, that uh, I would try to find some way, sooner or later, all of our boys are gonna grow up. I want to have conversations about what uh, sexual responsibility and healthy sexuality looks like, as well as um, please don't uh, hurt animals uh, because they uh, they need you and depend on you. That's sort of the best, uh, very brief answer that I've got. Um, I wish there was more research in that area. Um, if you want to send me an email privately, I'll go through my library just to make sure I'm not talking through my hat, but, um, uh, but that's my answer for now. Thank you. Uh, another question we got is, what are some sure. tools for more closely defining or measuring impulsivity? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> honestly, I've always thought of impulsivity as, la as being on such a continuum. Everything from, do you remember, what was the show with the character Horshack, who sat in the back of the room going, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me. Um, to the kind of impulsivity that leads to, hey, look, there's a car and the keys are in the ignition. Let's go for a joyride. Um, in terms of, I, so I don't tend to use a lot of measures myself for impulsivity, although I do, cons I, I do consider it on a sort of one to five uh, Likert scale um, as, I'm, uh, as I'm scoring other kinds of instruments or, uh, in a clinical assessment. Um, it's a great, I remember there was one called the Barrett Impulsivity Scale, B-A-R-R-A-T-T, -T, I believe it was, Impulsivity Scale. I'm not sure how current all of that is. So um, when I think about impulsivity, I'm thinking about the whole broad range um, of what we mean by that term. And again, um, in which context? At home, at school, in the community, etc. That's the best answer I got. Thank you. Becky, while you were speaking, this question came in. What credentials should I look for in a therapist for a young child around age 12 who is behaving inappropriately with other children? Are there particular programs or methods that you can recommend? As a caseworker, it is out of scope for what I can professionally bring up in topics of conversation when I interact with the child. There's a lot more information here, but let's start with that. Okay, that, that that's a great question. Actually, I think that that stymies a lot of people, parents and teachers and schools, like how do I find a good therapist? Well, first of all, if it's more immediate, feel free to email David or myself and tell us where you are and we can help you find someone. Secondly, the other way that you can do that would be to contact the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. Um, and you can find uh, their number and contact information on the internet at ATSA, A-T-S-A dot com. And they have a referral resource. Uh, if you contact David or I, we also have access to a lot of those names or we may know someone in the area. The, the, to put a finer point on that, so that's general how you could find someone um, the other way that you can find someone is to interview them, ask them, 
have they worked with youth who have uh, committed sexual offenses? Are they comfortable working with youth uh, who have committed sexual offenses? Uh, what is their philosophy in? about treatment? Yeah, including trauma-informed care. Right. Yeah. Are they able to deal with both the trauma and the acting out behaviors as well? So, so that would be my short answer. We're um, running a little bit late. It's uh, 3.56 East Coast time. Um, we have four minutes for wrap up. So I'm afraid we have to shut down the question and answer period. We have many more questions that came in. And what I will do is um, send those to you, David and Becky. And if you can write up some brief answers, we'll post them on our webinar page on the Neary Press website. I'd also like to suggest that people take a look at our Prevention for Professionals web pages because I think a lot of the answers to what you're asking about here, folks, um, can actually be answered by looking at the, the resources that we've created and curated on the website. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Becky and David. That was spot on, perfect. Um, and we really appreciate all the work you've done for Neary Press and Training Center and for this webinar. And we appreciate so your we'll, work. Thank yeah. you. We'll continue yeah. with the wrap up and I'm gonna turn my camera off just as we finish the last bits of business here. Um, I wanna tell you about CEs and give you a little information about how we're wrapping up our CE process as Neary Press and Training Center uh, begins its shutdown process. Low cost CE credits will be available for psychologists and social workers for this webinar. And for details about how to obtain those credits, you can visit nearypress.org backslash webinars, read through our CE process. If you still have questions after that, you can email Kristen uh, who oversees the webinar process. Her email address is there on the webpage about CEs. You can also um, find her contact information on our contact page uh, on the Neary Press and Training Center website. An important note is that this month is the last month you'll be able to earn CE credits uh, for this webinar and for all of our previous Neary webinars. As of June 30th, 2019, we will no longer be able to offer CE credits. We are, however, working to transfer the recordings of our webinars to another organization so that the webinars are accessible for viewing. Um, for the next four months, you'll be able to see those webinars on our YouTube channel and you can link to it from our website. After that, we will let people know where you can continue to watch uh, past webinars and just follow our website to, to get that information. Um, we have so loved producing for you our Research to Practice e-newsletter over the last 11 plus years. David Prescott, whom you heard present today, has been the heart of this endeavor with his monthly analysis of the latest research about youth with sexual behavior problems. We will be sending out one more newsletter before the Press and Training Center closes in September, so uh, please be sure to look out for it. I want to give an enormous shout out, a hearty thank you to all of our sponsors for this year's webinar series. You can see them all here on your screen. I'm very sorry that somebody seems to be cut off there at the bottom. We truly would not have been able to conduct these webinars without their support. We are so grateful to them. Thank you so much. And I just want to give a final thank you to David and Becky, our presenters, for such a knowledge-packed and helpful webinar. And a huge thank you to all of you for attending this and other Neary Press and Training Center webinars over the last several years. We have so appreciated your participation in our work and the collaborative learning processes that we've been able to create with you. With this webinar, we offer you a fond farewell before we close Neary Press and Training Center on September 30th. And last, I am going to make a shameless plug. Please check out our upcoming book sales. We're gonna be offering our entire stock of books at 50% off beginning on June 17th. 
Um, so it's a great chance to get all the Neary Press books that you know and love and get some new ones and for a very good price. Thank you all so much and goodbye.